Dr. Elizabeth Boone is an art historian, ethno-historian, an academic specializing in the study of Latin American art, and in particular the early colonial and pre-colonial art, as well as iconography and pictorial codices associated with the Mixtecs, Aztecs, and other Mesoamerican cultures in the Central Mexican region. Her extensive published research covers investigations into the nature of Aztec writing, the symbolism and structure of Aztec art and iconography, and the interpretation of Mixtec and Aztec codices. Dr. Boone earned her BA in Fine Arts at the College of William and Mary and completed her, completed her MA and PhD at the University of Texas at Austin on pre-Columbian art history. Oh, we, we, we are wrong horns. <laughs> well, that's how they call us, no? The, the ones who, well, who studied, the ones who studied there. Uh, I don't see my horn, but I am a long horn also. But uh, uh, she, uh, Dr. Wood is a former director of pre-Columbian studies and curator of the pre-Columbian collection at Dumbarton Oaks. Currently, Dr. Boone holds the Martha and Donald Robertson Chair in Latin American Art at Tulane University. She is also Research Associate at Tulane's Middle American Research Institute, MARI. Dr. Boone's accomplishments are too extensive to list, but in 1990 she was awarded the Orden de la Aguila Azteca, Order of the Aztec Eagle, Mexico's highest decoration awarded to non-citizens, and in 2010, Dr. Boone served as president of the American Society for Ethnohistory. Please, let's welcome Dr. Elizabeth Boone. Very nice introduction. It's such a great pleasure to be here when I got an email from Manuel asking, let me get this right, and then we'll be good. There. Um, so when I, I, I found out that there was going to be an homenaje for Patty, I said, yes, sign me up. I'll be there in a flash. And I, I wanted to say, it's just, you know, Patty is, well, we've all, everyone has talked about what a great scholar she is and, and um, her book, costumes of, you know, pre columbian costume and the Bible of world costume um, and, and the essential the Codex Mendoza and then the essential Codex Mendoza. I mean, these are just stupendous contributions to our field. Um, but I, I also want to sort of thank Patty personally because I think I met her um, when I came out here to Washington. Uh, I think I was staying with my sister. I was taking a little break from University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, I was teaching at UC Irvine, and I participated in the Tertulia, the Aztec Tertulia that Jim Lockhart and H.B. Nicholson were organizing. And I think it was Patty who called me up, and she said, there was an opening at Dumbarton Oaks, and you should apply. And I hadn't thought of it, and, I, and she talked me into it, and there we are. So thank you, Patty. It's, it's, it's been great. Um, this is my first foray in the costume. Um, but I'm doing this in honor of, of Patty Animal. In the 16th century, in the 16th century, it mattered what you wore. For Europeans living in Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Italy, clothing reflected and defined for others who you were socially and culturally. This was equally true in Aztec Mexico, where clothing announced a person's ethnicity, occupation, social status, relative wealth, gender, and marital status. In both Habsburg, Spain, and Montezuma's Mexico, merchants dressed differently than warriors, and both dressed differently than rulers. Dress was a fundamental part of who you were. People paid attention to distinctions of dress. Today I want to look at the presentation of indigenous Mexican dress in four pictorial manuscripts painted after the conquest. 
Three are Mexican and belong to the genre that I call the cultural encyclopedia. They were created in early colonial Mexico to explain features of Aztec culture to Europeans. These are the Codex Tudela, the Codex Rios, and Juan Bautista Pomar's Relacion de Texcoco, and these are the illustrations, the latter, the Pomar illustrations, are the ones that are now included in the Codex Isashosu. The fourth manuscript is a European one. It's the so-called Trachten book, or costume book, of a German artist called Christoph Weidetz. It records the costumes and characteristics of different regions of Spain, but it also records the Mexicans who accompanied Cortes to Spain in 1528, seven years after the conquest, and they joined the court of Charles V. All of these manuscripts strove to explain aspects of Aztec culture to Europeans, eager to know more about the look and manners of peoples of the Americas. Their paintings of Mexican costume responded to the intense European interest in regional dress. For Europeans, clothes were understood to reflect and even affect the habits and morals of a people. Let's look first at the Mexican manuscripts, and then I'll discuss the genre of the European costume book and swing by uh, Christopher Wyden's paintings, and then we'll return to the Mexican manuscripts to talk, about more, to talk more about their pictorial style. So the Codex Tudela is my first example. It's a pictorial encyclopedia of Aztec culture, one that focuses principally on religious ideology. Its paintings and texts picture and explain the calendar, the monthly feasts, the pulque gods, funerary customs, customs, and a range of other rites. A section devoted to regional dress. A section devoted to regional dress was added at the front of the original manuscript. And this was done probably just before it was sent to Spain. But this section was not part of the effort as it was originally conceived. This section once pictured the men's and women's costumes of seven different ethnicities. There were Mexicans, Guatemalans, Tarascans, Yopes, Veracruzanos, Huastecs, and Chichimecs. Most of these pages have been lost, however, so that only the Mexicans, a Yope man, a Guatemala man, and a Tarascan woman remain. We can see how the painter worked in a European style, much different from the style of the rest of the manuscript. And that style remains truer to indigenous pictography. And so here you have an example. You have the costume, the European style costume on the left, and the indigenous pictography on the right. This costume painter was a master of the contour line, a master of the use of light and shadow to depict death and the contrapposto pose that gave life to the human form. His paintings are delicate renderings, fully in the Renaissance style, much different from the modified pictography in the rest of the manuscript. And let me just say that um, Jose Tudela de la Orden originally published these, proposed that these were painted by Europeans. But I think it's fair to say that we now realize, we now these days realize that um, indigenous painters quickly, yearned, quickly learned uh, European conventions. And so the best painters in early colonial and mid-century Mexico were working in a European style. And so I'm sure that these were done by indigenous artists. So this is the Codex Tudela. Now the Codex Rios is my second example. It's also a cultural encyclopedia, one that includes a divinatory calendar, the monthly feast, an annals history, and sections on Aztec ideology. It has an eight-page section on native costume, which presents eight warriors of various rank. I'm sorry. It has an eight-page section on native costume, which presents five warriors of various rank. The ruler Motecuzoma, who represents the costume of an Aztec lord. It has a Zapotec man and two women wearing Mexican and Huastec dress. And we all know those women from Patty's early work. Its costume images are simpler and less refined than those in the Codex Tudela, but they also represent a range of dress types. The manuscript itself is a copy of the Codex Tolariana Remensis and perhaps other documents, but with expanded text written in Italian. 
The friar, Pedro de los Rios, had the codex created to send to an Italian colleague back in Europe. So it too is a presentation piece meant for a foreign audience. The third Mexican example is the group of paintings intended to illustrate Juan Bautista Pomar's Relacion de Texcoco, which are now bound together in the Codex East Associates. The six surviving paintings depict the Temple Mayor and the rain god Tlala, and you see those in the upper left, as well as four rulers of Texcoco, including the Coyotl and the Zahuacoyotl, and they're in the lower right. Usually, we don't think of these as a presentation of royal costumes. We think of them as ruler portraits. But they differ considerably from other representations of rulers because of the details of their costume. For example, the artists of the Codex Mendoza present the rulers of Mexico as nearly identi identical pictograms, each with his name sign. The artist of Saragun's Primeros Moriales does the same thing. For the Palmar illustrations, however, the artists, and there seem to be three of them at work here, lavish attention on the sumptuous details and elegance of the cloaks, the loincloths, the hair ornaments, and accoutrements, and on the Zawakotl's Coyotl's feathered military attire. Here, each costume is different, and the clothes make the ruler. These three Mexican representations of regional costume the dress of rulers, and the dress of warriors respond to European interests in the costumes of the world. Costume was an indication of culture, social status, and behavior, and Europeans in the 16th century were excited to learn about the dress of others. This excitement and interest in knowing about the world gave birth to a new publishing genre in Europe, the costume book. Costume books were collections of usually full-page illustrations of people and their clothing, with identifying captions and sometimes a short commentary. In this way, publishing houses in Paris, Antwerp, and Venice satisfied their clients' curiosity about faraway places. The first costume book appeared in Paris in 1558, one I'm showing you dates from 1564. But within 50 years of 1558, within 50 years, over a dozen other costume books were published in multiple editions. They became increasingly elaborate. And they had such descriptive titles, and this one is called Collection of the Variety of Costumes Presently Worn in the Countries of Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Wild Islands, the Il Sabah, I love that. Usually they begin with surveys of local costumes. And here we have the French Chevalier and the Demoiselle for the Parisian costume book. And then they gradually broaden their reach outward geographically. So here we go to Italy, Greece, Turkey, and the Wild Islands. And the Wild Islands in the mid-16th century meant the Americas, which meant Brazil. These costume books were not the fashion manuals like Vogue today. Rather, they were proto-ethnologies that brought information about other cultures and peoples to upper and middle class European homes. For those Europeans who could not travel the world, but who were interested in the strange people and customs of newly explored lands, costume books provided pleasant armchair travel that yielded both wonder and astonishment. The first Americans to be featured in Renaissance costume books were the Tupinamba from Brazil, who are represented as largely nude, except for feathered headdresses and skirts, and jewels in their faces. And Amy Buono, who was here yesterday, is a specialist on uh, Tupinamba feather uh, cloaks, and so she knows more about the Tupinamba than anyone in the world right now. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't access her dissertation, but so I'm just skimming the surface here. The Tupinamba were the first Amerindians that Europeans saw. Large numbers actually traveled to Europe with various explorers, and they were the people represented in many of the early prints. This woodcut, for example, from 1505, is one of the first representations of indigenous Americans. It shows them to be a cannibalistic people who wear feathered headdresses, feathered collars, feathered skirts, and feathers at their elbows and ankles. They have jewels in their chests, 
and in their cheeks. And I, I, don't, I don't think I have to point all that. We can see that. A map of Brazil from 1519, and this is the year Cortes landed, reinforces this notion of Brazilians as wearing feathered headdresses, capes, and skirts. So soon, Europe came to think of Amerindians in general as wearing feathers and studded with jewels. But as William Sturdivant has pointed out, this feathered skirt is a fabrication, probably derived from the small feathered belt the Tupinamba did wear. Nonetheless, the feathered skirt remained a favorite of artists who depicted Amerindians, or who depicted, depicted the personified allegories of America. My favorite of these allegories is a porcelain America from the 18th century. A woman who wears, and here she's largely nude, she wears the feathered skirt, a feathered crown, she holds a parrot and a cornucopia, and rides an alligator. The feathered skirt naturally made its appearance in the 16th century costume books. This tupinambization of indigenous Americans is also seen in Christoph Weiditz's costume book which includes paintings of the Mexicans whom Cortez brought with him to Spain. And now we turn back to our fourth manuscript that represents Mexican costumes. Christoph Weiditz was a German medalist, a German artist, who joined the court of Charles V briefly in 1529 and traveled with it for some months before returning home to Germany. During and after the trip, he painted images of the Mexicans as well as others he encountered in his travels. And these others included a Spanish noblewoman, I'm just showing your range here, Castilian peasants, Morisco women of Granada, and women of Galicia. His paintings highlight the distinctions of regional dress. A dozen of Vitez's paintings have been identified as, and I quote from the Vitez's uh, caption, Mexicans brought by Cortez, unquote. There are several men and one woman all wearing feathered capes and skirts, two nearly nude men with such exotic accoutrements as a parrot and a feathered standard and a shield and spear, and several paintings of entertainers, ball players, dice players, and jugglers who roll and flip a large log with their feet. Who are these people? They are almost always identified as Aztec by pretty much everyone who's written on by them. And indeed, most scholars consider them to be the first European images of Aztecs drawn from life. But they don't look very Aztec to me. The men have lip gloves and ear ornaments, which the Aztecs did wear. But they also have jewels in their cheeks, jewels in the sides of their noses, and a jewel in the center of their foreheads, which Mesoamericans did not have. And most wear feathered skirts. Indeed, it's their jewels studded skin and feathered skirts and cloaks that give them the appearance of the Tupinamba of Brazil. We know a fair amount about the Mexicans who actually did accompany Cortes to Spain in 1528. It was a large group that included three dozen principals and seven high-ranking Aztec nobles, including sons of both Motecuzoma and the ruler of Tlaxcala, as well as a large number of entertainers. Among the entertainers were a dozen ball players, eight or nine foot jugglers, male and female dwarfs, as well as hunchbacks and albinos. This troop of exotica also included animals unknown in Europe, wild cats, pelicans, an armadillo, and a possum, as well as a treasure trove of gold and silver objects and feathered and luminous feather creations. In he, Cortez brought a whole spectacle making a grand entrance at court to the delight of the king. And as I was researching for this, when Cortes marched to Honduras to put um, out a rebellion, he also took a kind of menagerie and entertainers with him, including dwarfs. So Cortes, when he traveled, he liked to travel with this whole kind of court of entertainers. Uh, it was a very 16th century thing. Weiditz focused his attention on the entertainers, especially the ball players and the log jugglers, who amazed all who saw them perform. I propose that the other visitors, the standing men and women, 
are also entertainers. Although the German, art, the German text labels the man on the upper left who holds a parrot and a feathered standard as a noble. And here's a, a close-up. So he's the one on the upper left, labeled an Aztec noble. All of these men are barefoot and have feathered capes and are skirts and jewel-studded faces. No Aztec noble would have appeared at the court of Charles V dressed this way. Back home in Mexico, Aztec nobles before the conquest would have worn fine cotton cloaks and loincloths of intricate design, not the coarse and bulky feathered cloaks and loincloths of Christopher Vidas' images. They would have had fancy sandals and elaborate headdresses. Vidas' images stand out for the darkness of the men's skin, their bare feet, their heavy feathered cloaks, their feathered skirts, and their jeweled faces. They have golden studs below their, it, their lips and jewels on the sides of their noses, on, on their cheeks, and in the center of their foreheads. Only the lip plug was worn by Aztec nobles. The feathered cloaks were probably an adaption of the feathered creations that Cortez brought with him from Mexico, which so astounded the court. But someone later added even more feathers and further Brazilianized the men's wardrobe. So a close look at the feathered skirt shows that these feathers were added later to the original loincloth. I'll just point that. So you have the loincloth here and the feathers added and feathers added here and this whole panel of feathers were added after the manuscript was originally created. So Vidas, or someone else, united Tupinamba feathered cloaks, Aztec featherwork, with fabricated feather skirts and jewel-studded faces to create a highly exoticized group of Mexicans. Vidas' so-called Aztecs, supposedly drawn from life, are not very Aztec at all. As for the Aztec nobles who did attend the court of Charles V, they would not have worn their ancestral garb, but they would have worn the clothing of European courtiers, for it was the tradition of the Habsburg court to furnish wardrobes to anyone who attended that court, befitting their status and rank. Indeed, a major expense of royal courts was the clothing required by its members. Charles V had already given earlier Aztec visitors clothes to wear at court when they arrived. And for this group, he also gave them clothing before they departed. Coats and hats of blue velvet, doublets of yellow damask, scarlet capes and breeches, and shoes with ribbons. In the 16th century, clothes were political currency, which displayed power relations and marked allegiance. Gifts of clothing to nobles and to other rulers carried great social weight. Let's turn back now to the costumes in Mexican encyclopedias. They participate even more than do Vidas's paintings in the genre of the costume book. The Mexican paintings are very similar to images found in European costume books. Their figures fill an undefined space, a space without a background or elements of landscape. The human form is rendered as a three-dimensional presence, modeled in light and shadow, and posed in a decidedly contrapposto pose with the feet set at an angle and the weight on one foot. We see the convention of one foot frontally forward and one foot back in profile. One hand is out, another holds the object. The pose is open to reveal the details of clothing. We see the care the artist took to articulate a corporeal body whose edges are defined by the curved contour line and whose volumes are modeled in light and dark. The equal care the artist took to show the folds, the boards, and the volumes of the beautifully draped clothing. The Pomar illustrations picture the costumes of the Tezcocan kings, but the paintings in the Codex Rios and Codex Tudelar cover a range of ethnicities and genres. Forming parts of cultural encyclopedias, they are by nature more encyclopedic. The Rios imagery includes explanatory explanatory descriptions, but, re but retain something of the flatness of pre-conquest pictography. 
The Tudela images have only short labels and belong fully to the European Renaissance stylistic canon, with figures delicately rendered in three dimensions and situated in an indeterminate space. These Tudela images seem also to represent the indigenous people not as they used to dress, but as they were dressing at the time the manuscript was painted. And I say this because the Mexican, the Mexican man, although he's sandal and wears a standard tilma or cloak knotted over one shoulder, he's also clothed in a long sleeve tunic, one with gathered cuffs and a neckband stiffened with embroidery or lace. It is the kind of male tunic that indigenous men wore after the conquest, but not before. And we see this all throughout Sagun's manuscript when they're depicting people at work at the time and in manuscripts like the Codex of Sun and all of that. This then, this image then, represents not the costume of the ancient civilization, but of the contemporary Nahuas then living in New Spain. So to summarize, the Pomar illustrations and images in the Codex Rios and Codex Tudela participate fully in the canons of costume display. They were intended to show Europeans how indigenous Mexicans dressed. Images like this, although perhaps not all of these exact ones, entered the visual world of Renaissance Europe. Equally, they drove out some of the feathered skirts and the feathered headdresses. But real accuracy was hard to achieve. Cesare Vicellio's famous costume book of 1599 illustrates two Mexican men. The one on the left wears a standard man's cloak and has his hair up in what is perhaps a version of a warrior's top knot, illustrated like that illustrated in the Codex Rios. But he is barefooted like the Vitas entertainers and like the Brazilian Tupinamba. He wears the colonial sleeve tunic under his cloak. But is that a fre feathered fringe we see? On the right, a young man wears a tunic and what may be a vestige of a feathered skirt. So here, in the, at the turn of the century, Europeans still insisted that their Amerindians, including the Aztecs, wore feathered skirts. Thank you very much.